Um, I am Jane Eliasoff, for those of you who don't know me. Um, I am the director of the Montclair History Center, and I um, um, would like to welcome you to our History at Home series. If you are not uh, getting our emails um, that tell you about our programs, I encourage you to go onto our website, scroll down to the bottom, and you can subscribe to our email list. That We have been doing these programs free of charge, um, and I thank everyone who has given us donations to help support them. Um, if you have not and would like to give us a donation, you can do so either at um, the website, there's a join or donate button. Um, you can do it on Venmo, just search for Montclair History Center, my name will pop up, but that doesn't really matter, it's still going to the Montclair History Center. We now accept Zelle, um, and we also take old fashioned checks that you could just send to the Montclair History Center at 108 Orange Road in Montclair, New Jersey. Um, and with that, I am going to turn it over to Joe. Um, Joe is the West Orange historian, but Joe is, um, I, as I said earlier, I feel like he's a caretaker um, of the stories that are buried here. He really, he knows, it almost feels like he knew the people. Um, and so I am excited to see this presentation. I was lucky enough to walk there with him once and it was just it was loads of fun and really interesting so Joe I'm going to turn it over to you you can start your screen sharing which you started before and now you've disappeared okay uh good afternoon everyone and uh, welcome to today's presentation it's nice to see some familiar names here and uh some not familiar names thank you everyone for coming uh I would just like to point out I see um in the audience is uh uh, Don Dorflinger and his wife, uh, they are Orange historians, uh, certainly grateful to have them here. And perhaps if we have time at the end, uh, Don can say a few words. I also see uh, here uh, Vince uh, Damon is here uh, and he is the uh, St. Mark's, uh, the person responsible for storing, restoring St. Mark's Cemetery, which is next to um, the old burying ground. And we'll get into that a little bit. So um, I'm glad Vince is here. So if uh, we have any questions about St. Mark's perhaps, uh, he can he can help us out here. Uh, as I, uh, my name is Joe Fagan. As Jane mentioned, I am the uh, West Orange official historian. I'm also West Orange's public information officer, and I'm a consultant for the Downtown West Orange Alliance. I've written four you? books on the history of uh, West Orange. West Orange. I write a newspaper column. Uh, I do a cable TV oh, show. Oh. I've done lectures and presentations, and I certainly maintain a presence on oh, Facebook. No, I uh, so as I say, I want to thank you. Uh, I thank, thanks to Jane and uh, to the Montclair History Center for the opportunity to present this monumental and forgotten piece of our local history. Last November, um, I believe it was November, many will remember that Aaron Benz gave a beautiful, beautiful presentation on the history of Rosedale Cemetery. In that presentation, it was easy to see how well the history was preserved and the grounds were preserved. And even the records are kept in, in, in a vault on premises and kept safe. Rose, Rosedale began in 1840 and 181 years later is basically intact and poised to face the future. In today's, in today's presentation uh, of the old burying ground, we're gonna see a very stark contrast to Rosedale. The old burying ground is 300 years old and nothing like what we saw in Aaron's presentation regarding Rosedale. It is on the verge of oblivion. There's no office to find records of those buried there and the grounds are in very bad shape as we will see today. This problem, however, has plagued the old burying ground for more than a century, but is an important part of its history. Um, the primary difference between uh, Rosedale and uh, the old burying ground is that um, Rosedale is a commercial burial ground, whereas this is a, domination, uh, a denominational burial ground associated with the church. Uh, I have been researching the old burying ground for a better part of 20 years, and it's really an ongoing process that never stops because there's so much to learn. Uh, I'm always digging something up new, uh, pardon the pun, uh, but there's so much to learn here. And the materials today that you will see come from my own personal collection of thousands and thousands of documents I really have amassed over the years. And uh, I really have my own research library here. Um, many, many of these documents, many of these books you will find in, in libraries, but not under one roof. I have them all under one roof and I have many documents um, that I recovered from the trash uh, that have survived the uh, uh, first church fire in 1927 that you will not find anywhere else. 
it is my hope that uh, making this history known uh, that we um, uh, can, can somehow contribute to the future of the old burying ground because it exists as a true portal in time and hiding in plain view uh, where one can literally walk back in time from the hectic pace of the 21st century by taking just one step off of Main Street. So as we begin today, this is uh, some of the, uh, this is what I'm gonna be talking about today. Um, uh, and what I, what I really wanna point out is that throughout the presentation, you'll see a star icon on some of the items here. And I wanna let you know that that was found in the garbage in 2010. Um, that, uh, I found it in the garbage and uh, had it I not found it, it might not be here. And you will also see, um, a, uh, a fire icon and, and that's further indication that it was uh, not only found in the garbage, but it also survived the 1927 uh, fire. Uh, I will be giving um, uh, my contact information, but you can certainly follow me on Facebook under Joseph Fagan. So uh, uh, first part, general introduction. Um, there, I, I, of course, we're talking about the old burying ground here um, there's an old burying ground in Newark also, um, but we're talking about the old burying ground here in, in uh, Orange at the corner of Sco uh, Scotland Road and um, Main Street. And there's three important dates and we'll get into them uh, as we go on, but there's three important dates to uh, recognize here. And the first one of course is 1723. This plot of land has been there since 1723. Um, the church itself has only been there since 1927 and that's kind of an oddity in that the uh, church doesn't match the uh, age of the old burying ground, um, uh, at least with that big of a gap. Um, sometimes there is, a, there is a, a little difference, but this is obviously a very large gap. And the third important date here is 1907, and that was the um, installation of the uh, dispatch rider. And um, uh, it's hard to see here, and, and we'll get into it a little bit later when I talk it in that section, but I'm actually wearing the, uh, an original uh, official badge of the 1907 centennial celebration here. That's what I'm wearing here uh, today. Um, hopefully it will bring me luck because I'm so nervous with all these people here. Um, so, uh, much has been written over the years about the um, history uh, in newspapers. Uh, there's always a newspaper article that seems to pop up every five years, but it's not really anything new, any new information. It's, um, uh, it's really regurgitated information. Someone takes interest in it and they go there and they do a little research, but they're finding out the same information over and over again. So hopefully today we, uh, I will be able to um, uh, give some new information. Now, there are um, three important books that have been written, uh, three primary important books that have been written about the history. And the first one was 1860, and that's The Mountain Society by James Hoyt. He's a former pastor of the church. Um, I co of course, I have a copy of that book right in front of me here. The other uh, good information is uh, the uh, official program from the 1907 exercises. They have about 10 pages about the history of the old burying ground in there. A lot of new information actually, uh, new to 1907. Um, and, uh, but it, you really can't find this program anywhere. Um, a very few copies uh, exist, uh, let alone survive. And this book uh, published in 1969 is really a pretty concise history of the uh, First Presbyterian Church in Orange um, and that talks about the, uh, the, old, burying, the old burying ground. Um, uh, interesting is that book, uh, it actually talks about that the uh, property of the old burying ground uh, during the um, days of the Revolutionary War, it actually served as an encampment for um, uh, British artillery uh, that was actually camped out there. And there's some interesting stories about that. And it also talks about how the old burying ground uh, was actually uh, rented out for, uh, for pasture uh, in, in, in those days. So uh, some really interesting history that is really kind of lost upon the, uh, the, the 21st century. So uh, I just want a few slides here to just give you a, a further clarification of where, we're, where it is we're talking about. We're of course talking about the intersection of Scotland Road and uh, uh, Main Street, and that's the First Presbyterian Church Old Burying Ground. And uh, it, it, it 
the, the church was founded in 17, uh, 1719 and it uh, lasted to um, 2010. So that's 291 years of history of the church alone. And uh, I kind of written an epitaph for the, uh, for the church, uh, if there was one to be written, that it is fondly remembered as the cornerstone of our community heritage and history. And that is really an understatement because many of the early settlers of the uh, oranges um, are uh, 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 not just West Orange, the oranges in general, uh, Dodd family, Freeman family, Williams family, they can all be uh, found there. Um, and it, a portion of that, you know, you look at that and you see one cemetery, and this is why I mentioned Vince Damon's name earlier, because there actually is a portion of the, uh, of the old burying ground that actually belongs to St. Mark's Church in West Orange. Uh, that came to be in 1836. And um, if you visit the grounds, you'll see a stark contrast between the First Presbyterian Church side and the uh, St. Mark's uh, Cemetery because uh, Vince Damon is, is responsible for bringing that back to life um, uh, at the old burying ground. Um, so it, we're talking, I wanna go over th uh, some uh, tombstone uh, epitaphs uh, very quickly uh, because they add some texture to the story. Um, they, they deliver a, a message to the past uh, about someone's life. And many of the epitaphs are, are no longer found on the tombstones because the tombstones are crumbling. Um, you know, and, and here you can see a picture from 1902 of you know, just crumbling tombstones. Uh, um, we don't know uh, who these people were, where they're buried. Um, or uh, you know anything about them. And it's a shame because history is crumbling before our eyes here, but this is 1902. But if you look at the present day, uh, it's really not much different. It's, uh, it's still crumbling um, uh, right before our, before, before our eyes. It's not a new problem. Um, uh, here you can see, um, this is a good example of a, a motif and a meaning, a, a meaning, the motif at the, at the top, and you'll see several variations of this. Uh, throughout the old burying ground and the wings mean spirit of flight or the uh, spirit rising to heaven. Uh, and you can see on the bottom of this tombstone that the epitaph is, is pretty much missing um, as is the case uh, with many of them here, but they have been recorded. Uh, they're just difficult to find within this cemetery. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, this is, um, in memory of uh, Abigail, wife of Matthew Williams. Uh, and uh, a woman's epitaph may, may not call her wife, it may call her a consort, which is just uh, means a spouse and there is no pejorative con connotation to that. Uh, also, um, you might see wife, uh, uh, mistress, mistress might, might also mean wife on there. And uh, you'll see on this, it says, here lies ye body of Elizabeth. Now, ye doesn't mean ye, uh, the pronoun, it means the, uh, and that sometimes is, is, is misunderstood. Um, uh, here's a couple of epitaphs. Uh, you can read them as I go through them. They are, uh, they are the dead speaking to, uh, to, to the living uh, with their message. Um, they often speak of uh, distress and, and certainly reflect emotion uh, at that time. And uh, they are, they are thought provoking and they remind us uh, in many ways of our own mortality. Um, th this particular one here, uh, it, you know, there's often sometimes a hidden message here and it says, here lies a blooming youth. He lived in love and died in truth. Uh, you know, I look at that, I guess there's many ways that could be interpreted. I'm thinking maybe there was a love triangle going on here and this is the way that they expressed it in the, uh, during that time. Uh, we, we, we just don't know. Um, uh, epitaphs certainly are not unique to the old burying ground, but they give us a sharp uh, vignette and insight into understanding another area. And it, it makes you curious about the, uh, the person buried there and, and how they lived. Uh, the meeting houses, now, you know, don't be confused by the term meeting house uh, because meeting house is just another word for church. And in this section, we're gonna examine the relationship between the old burying ground and the First Presbyterian Church of Orange because their history is interwoven and impossible to separate. Uh, the first meeting house, uh, uh, I have the dates here, 1719, 1754. I'm sorry, I don't know what I did. Um, 
and this is really the beginning of uh, the church, and, but it, when it was known as the, uh, the Mountain Society. And the meeting house was located on Main Street, just further down on Main Street in Orange. And it was just a small building here. There are no pictures. This is an artist's conception. And um, uh, it, it was long known as the, the Newark Mountain. And it didn't be at the church on the Newark Mountain. It didn't become Presbyterian until 1748. Uh, and it was located really where Military Common is now, right, uh, right by Park Street. Uh, and this is James Hoyt, uh, and, and he wrote the history of the Mountain Society, and a lot of the early history of the first church uh, we know comes from him. Um, the, at that location, this is when the old burying ground came about in 1723. Uh, a church member, Nathaniel Wheeler, donated the land for the old burying ground to the uh, to the Mountain Society, and it was um, at, at the first grave there was in 1723. Anthony Olaf, and uh, we're going to talk about him later. There's a, a few things that I really want to say in depth about him, um, and it was. It moved up Main Street. It never really left Main Street. It moved to its second location uh, and, and was there for, uh, during the years uh, to 1813. And it was um, incorporated as a second Presbyterian of Church as, uh, of Newark at that time. And uh, two additional acres were purchased at the old burying ground in 1792. And it uh, formed uh, the, basically the boundaries of the old burying ground as, 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 we, know it, as we know it today. Uh, and actually became the, the name actually changed to First Presbyterian of Ch uh, Church of Orange in 1811. And of course, that, that's uh, how it's known today. Um, and it was located where the Orange Savings Bank is. It's uh, uh, kind of, or was kind of on the corner of North Day, Day Street and South Day Street in Orange. And um, when it moved to the third meeting house, it was really kind of across the street. Uh, uh, where um, next to me where Music Hall was, uh, that was uh, a um, um, uh, like a convention center. Uh, many events were held there um, and that opened in 1880. Um, but this would be the home for the next 114 years. And it probably would still be there today um, if it wasn't for um, a, a fire there. Um, in, in At that location in 1901, uh, Pastor Townsend, he uh, sealed a hundred year time capsule and uh, that time capsule was opened in 2001. And I got many of the contents of that time capsule and some of them actually are gonna be into these, today's presentation. Um, but I was ta talking earlier to Elizabeth and uh, she mentioned she was Dive family uh, descendant and um, it wasn't in that time capsule, but one of the documents um, that was saved was a Dodd family records, handwritten Dodd family records that I'm going to share with her that really might be helpful. Um, <laughs> as I mentioned, it moved across the street uh, and may still have been there if it wasn't for a devastating fire in, in 1927. And uh, these newspapers that you see here, these aren't something I found online. This is actually something that survived the fire. Um, uh, or didn't survive the fire, be, uh, but came to the uh, the new church location, and, and and what I found in in in, in the garbage being uh, being discarded. Uh, here you can see a picture of the fire, and you can see the star there, which indicates I have the negative of this picture, uh, which uh, was found in the garbage uh, that was being discarded when the church closed. So uh, on the uh, right hand there, you can see uh, Music Hall. That's really where the fire started, and it jumped across to the uh, First Presbyterian Church and, and basically destroyed it. It could not be saved. Uh, this is a, a picture of the old burying ground there. And it's kind of odd to see the old burying ground uh, with no church there, but that's uh, essentially what it looked like uh, before the uh, uh, church moved to this location. Uh, this is a picture uh, that I found. Um, and this is the groundbreaking 1927. That's uh, uh, the pastor at that time. Um, and that's in the old burying ground. So the fourth meeting house uh, came to be in the old burying ground or the, uh, the fourth church, the current day church uh, uh, in the old burying ground uh, that dated back to 1723. And uh, um, there were graves that had to be removed and relocated. And uh, it's reported that a lot of them went to uh, Rosedale Cemetery. Um, and uh, some of them, you know, 
there's no saying how many people are interred there or are buried there. And, you know, um, but the uh, graves did have to be moved to build the, uh, build the current day church. Um, today, it is the first shallow Baptist church in, in, uh, in 2016. Uh, the church closed in 2010, but in 2016 to present, uh, it, it, it's now currently being used as the first Shiloh Baptist Church. And uh, when they moved in, they really were unaware of, of, of the history. They knew, of course, it was old and that there was a lot of history here, but they were really unaware of uh, what they had there. Uh, the, the building does have a lot of markers. Uh, you can see the cornerstone here. It actually says 1719, 1928. Of course, the church wasn't built in 1719, uh, but that cornerstone there uh, is an indication of the beginning of the church when it was known as the, uh, as the Mountain Society. Anthony Olaf, uh, this is one person that uh, I really wanted to talk about. He's the first interment at the, uh, at the, um, uh, at the old burying ground here. And coincidentally, he was the first settler of what became West Orange. He lived in uh, um, West Orange long before it was in, in West Llewellyn Park, uh, more than a century and a half before it became a Llewellyn Park. And here you can see a picture of his tombstone from the 1890s. Uh, and it, it says, I think, um, his name is spelled Olaf, or his name, but it's pronounced olive and, some, and sometimes misspelled. Uh, his, so it's, I believe he's Norwegian uh, and it's, his real name is, his name is Anthony Olive, uh, but uh, Olaf. And so there's a, a lot of uh, confusion concerning that. Uh, it says, here lies the body of Anthony Olaf who departed the li this life March the 16th in the year 1723, age 87. It's actually amazing that in 1723, he was 87 years old and was able to survive that long. Uh, this is a document here that I have right in front of me. Actually, it survived the fire and I found it in the garbage. And this is an actual document written in 1840s by uh, Pastor White. And uh, he, he mentions here uh, that the first burial in our uh, yard was in 1723, a man by the name of Anthony Olive. Um, now, uh, history uh, has recorded him as the first person interred there, um, but this is just further documentation and actually uh, uh, President um, Pastor White was trying to document the history of the church and this was one of his documents and I have several others. Um, here's some quick facts that we know about Anthony Olaf. He was born in 1636 and he's first mentioned in 1677 in the town records. Uh, when he came to West Orange, or what became West Orange, obviously it wasn't what it is today. It was a pristine wilderness, and he often had to deal with uh, wild animals. And as I mentioned, his farm was located in today's Llewellyn Park. And uh, he, he was uh, what they would call a uh, fence viewer, and I think that he would go out and make inspections. And uh, because at that time it was important that people had fences about around their property to keep their livestock in. And I, I think he would go out and inspect them to uh, make sure that everything was, uh, was, was kept up so that there was no problems. Uh, here you have uh, a 1720 map. Uh, and you can see that this area here in the shaded area is what became West Orange. And you can see that Anthony Olaf is, uh, is mentioned there. So he, he truly was alone. Uh, in West Orange at that time. And I love it that he's West Orange's uh, first settler. Um, and uh, his tombstone is reported to have been, to be the oldest in uh, Essex County, which is amazing. Uh, the oldest tombstone in New Jersey that I can find, it only is about 40 years older than this. Uh, so this is the oldest tombstone in Essex County, uh, dating to 1723. Um, However, his tombstone is no longer in the graveyard. In 1969, at the, 20, the 250th anniversary of the church, they decided to honor Anthony Olaf. And what they did is they took the tombstone out and they replaced it with this, uh, a current day marker. And this is what's in the uh, graveyard today is Anthony Olaf's memorial tombstone, which was placed there in 1969. Uh, and what they did with the original tombstone is they took it inside the church um, to preserve it. Um, 
However, uh, the church closed in 2010. And uh, as I mentioned, it was uh, bought by First Shiloh in 2016. So uh, what I thought to do when First Shiloh took it over, I contacted them and said, hey, do you have the tombstone of Anthony Olaf? And they're like, yeah, we got something here. We don't know what it is. Uh, you know, I'm glad you called because we're gonna throw it out. So on August 30th, 2016, I went down and I picked up the oldest tombstone in Essex County. And I have it in my possession today. Here it is pictured in my office. And you can see that it is in very good shape. It certainly shows some signs of wear, but it's still very legible and it must weigh 300 pounds. Uh, but when I went down to pick it up that day, they actually helped me load it in the car and uh, they gave it to me, not because they were uh, looking to get rid of it. Uh, I mean, they were looking to get rid of it, but they also knew who I was and they also knew that I would be preserving it for posterity. And uh, it is my hope that this goes into a West Orange Museum. Uh, I am collecting artifacts for that. Uh, and it would just be, it's just so, the importance of this tombstone, I can't overstate the importance enough. It's the oldest known tombstone in Essex County. Um, and uh, it's uh, the first settler of West Orange. So it's just, just an amazing artifact that has survived uh, for, over, for, for just about 300 years. And uh, certainly, um, uh, my work with the Downtown Alliance, um, uh, I, I raise money and I install um, uh, historical markers. And this marker I, I was installed in March of 2017 outside of Llewellyn Park at the corner of uh, Park Avenue and Main Street. And uh, uh, it does mention uh, that Anthony Olaf, uh, first seller of West Orange, uh, lived not far from this location. But it's really cool to have his, uh, to have his tombstone. Uh, another person who coincidentally uh, grew, uh, lived in what is current day West Orange and is buried uh, in the old burying ground is Jemima Condit. She, and she could be, um, you know, I, I'm, the, you know, I'm considered the West Orange Township historian. I'm not the first. Uh, Don Dorflinger is an orange historian, but the really first historian of the uh, of, of our area. Uh, has to go to this woman, Jemima Condit. She's the first historian. Uh, and the reason she's the first historian uh, or can be considered such is because she kept a diary. Um, and this was an article that was uh, in uh, Star Ledger from 1975. And um, she was born in the Pleasant Valley, which is known as the Pleasantdale section in West Orange today in 1754. Um, and she kept a diary uh, beginning at age 18, uh, not for a long period of time, for just a little over two years, uh, but the information contained in that diary is really invaluable. Um, uh, her family, they attended the church at the Newark Mountains, and would, the church that later became the First Presbyterian Church of Orange. And uh, she died at a young age, 25, um, in, in 1779. And that diary is preserved today in the uh, archives of the New Jersey Historical Society. Uh, but good luck trying to see it. Um, you know, it's uh, trying to get anything. Uh, I mean, they're understaffed um, and, you know, so, certainly during COVID, but um, they just wouldn't let anybody look at this. And, and, and even if you uh, asked any document, uh, you know, my understanding is it's four to six weeks until they can dig it up. Um, in 1930, uh, a limited amount of uh, copies of the diary were made available by the Carteret Book Club. Um, I think it was 500 copies and I have uh, actually two of them here in my office. Um, so there's only 498 out there. Um, and these are some of the things that she wrote about. Uh, she, that it seems like we we're having trouble. There was a great disturbance in the earth and they say it is tea that caused it. Of course, her references to the Boston Tea Party of 1773. Uh, she, another uh, key entry is every day brings new troubles. This day brings news that they begin to fight near Boston. Of course, this is, she's talking about the shot heard around the world, uh, the opening battles of Concord and Lexington uh, in Massachusetts in 1775. Um, she is buried and this is a picture of her grave there. Uh, and you can see it's in bad shape uh, as most of them are. There's this moss that's growing on there. And uh, it says in memory of Jemima, Jemima, wife of Aaron Harrison who died uh, in 24th year of her age. Um, 
This is a picture uh, that actually is, uh, her house is someplace in this picture. And this uh, location uh, is, you've passed this location and never knew it because it's across from the Thomas Edison National Historical Park. Uh, once she married her, uh, Aaron, her Harrison, her husband, that's where they live and that's where she died. Um, there, uh, that's her grave there. And there's a memorial boulder there that uh, has this plaque on it in memory of Jemima Condon. Um, and uh, wife of Aaron Harrison. And this was placed by the Daughters of the American Revolution in, in uh, the 1930s there. Um, however, uh, one problem that always has plagued the old burying ground is vandalism. And I'm sorry to say that that plaque is now missing uh, and missing within the last year. I visit the grounds on a regular basis and uh, I, I was horrified to see that someone removed this plaque and it is no longer there and uh, very uh, likely that it would ever be replaced. Um, you know, so that is gone, but her grave is still there. Uh, but certainly no one really knows her story. Uh, many of us here do today, but uh, the general public at large really does not know her story. Uh, and here you can see uh, her, um, the location of the, uh, of the memorial boulder and, 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 and her grave. Um, and this is a picture of uh, descendants of her family. And I put this up there because uh, for sure there is a family resemblance here somewhere. Uh, um, and one of these women actually has the name of Jemima Condit. I just forget which one, um, but you can see how, uh, you know, what, what family resemblance and, and maybe, maybe what she may, may, have, may have looked like. Uh, the other person I wanna talk about is uh, Mary Williams, a patriot remembered. And uh, there, this is just really another story that, uh, uh, is really, in, in, in my estimation, uh, an, an unbelievable story and one that I'm just very glad to tell and, and should be known. And um, uh, here, here you see a picture of Mary Williams' grave and, and uh, she's actually, those two graves to the left and the right are actually children of hers. And this is the exact spot where Mary Williams would have stood with her husband, Nathaniel, uh, when these children were buried. And this is unchanged uh, from, from that time. Um, it's hard to see what's on her grave. Here I have a facsimile reproduction. A wife of Nathaniel Williams who died July 3rd, 1816 in the 80th year of her age. Uh, but her story gets very interesting. Um, she is known as the heroine of the mountains and for good reason. Um, in um, uh, 1920s, the um, uh, Daughters of the American Revolution, they replaced, they, they placed this plaque uh, uh, on the boulder in front of Eagle Rock School as a uh, memory to Mary Williams. And um, that plaque was um, placed there, as I said, uh, in the 1920s. Um, and this is what it looks like today. And uh, I, might, I might mention that uh, Eagle Rock School in West Orange is on Valley Way. And I went to Our Lady of Lords Grammar School. And uh, um, from fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, uh, this this always intrigued me. I would always cross the street and I would go always go up and read this plaque, and uh, uh, I never really quite understood what this what it was saying or what it was telling me. And each year I would go thinking, okay, I'm going to understand it this year, but never really understood it until years later. Um, but uh, as vandals will do, uh, this plaque went missing in 1974, and the boulder is there, but the plaque is no longer there. Uh, so her story is kind of um, kind, kind of uh, uh, hidden and forgotten about. And this is what the plaque said. And it, it says here that uh, she gave freely of her supplies to Washington's troop while her husband, Nathaniel, and two sons were with the British forces. So let's just talk about that for a minute, exactly what happened and why we remember her today. This is a plaque that's on the uh, back of her grave. Uh, that was also installed uh, by the Daughters of Amer American Revolution, 1934. And uh, I check this out frequently. It's still there. The plaque is still there, uh, thank God. But um, I wonder how long it's gonna still be there. And I even uh, ha am tempted to speak to the pastor and ask him if I could remove it for posterity so that it doesn't get stolen. Um, but um, you know, it, I, I don't want to um, disturb her grave or certainly break the tombstone. Uh, and you know, really, what right do I have to to ask for it? But uh, so let's just hope it stays there. Um, Mary Williams, uh, she lived in current day West Orange. Uh, they were married in 1755. Nathaniel Williams. They had eight children. 
as I mentioned, two of them died uh, at a very young age. Nathaniel and her brother uh, and his brother Benjamin, they were ingrained with a deep royalty to the British crown. They were loyalists. Uh, they wanted no part of the American Revolution or the, or the colonists or American freedom. They were living a very comfortable lifestyle, as was Mary. Um, and in 1770, this is when Nathaniel and Mary lost two of their children uh, at a very young age. Uh, so when I go there and I stand in front of her grave, I'm thinking this is exactly where her and her husband would have stood uh, in 1770 and for years after uh, mourning the loss of their children. Um, Tory Corner on West Orange was a gathering point for Tory, Tories who were loyalists to the British crown. Uh, in fact, the area was first known as Williamsville uh, after the Williams brothers. Uh, and then uh, as they came, it took on the name of Tory Corner. And there is a marker here at Tory Corner uh, that mentions Nathaniel and uh, uh, Benjamin Williams uh, and how the uh, area Tory Corner, Corner became to be known. And Mary Williams is mentioned on there. I don't think I put it on there, but she is mentioned on the back of this. So even if you pull up and you read it, you actually have to go to the back to, to, to read about Mary Williams. Now, um, when Washington crossed the Delaware in uh, 1776 on uh, Christmas, that's when things changed for the Tories in, 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 uh, in, in New Jersey. As Washington started to win back um, uh, New Jersey, uh, Washington wanted all the Tories uh, identified. Uh, and um, he, he gave a deadline, I believe it was August 3rd, 1777, uh, where the Tories could pledge an allegiance to the American cause um, uh, or their property would be confiscated. Uh, so what had happened was, um, uh, this is a, a depiction of uh, where, where Mary uh, Williams lived. Uh, on the farm, it was at the bottom of Eagle Rock Avenue. What happened was uh, Benjamin Williams, Nathaniel's brother, uh, he took the pardon, but he didn't really, he, he did it only to protect himself. He didn't believe in the American cause whatsoever. Nathaniel <clears throat> Williams, however, did not take the pardon. Uh, he took two of his uh, oldest sons, um, uh, Amos and James, and went to New York City. He, he essentially abandoned Mary. Uh, in West Orange. Their family split up over the cause for American independence. And uh, Mary Williams was left to fend for herself. She, she would not go with Nathaniel. She believed in the ultimate, in Washington's ultimate victory. So she stayed behind and she had to actually buy back the farm because it, uh, under law at that time, it was her husband's property. And um, uh, it was preconceived that no one else would bid on the farm, only Mary Williams would, and it was far below market value. So she was able to uh, retain the farm. But what was interesting is that she, of course, uh, supported the American cause. Her next oldest son, Zenith Williams, went to uh, fight with the es Essex militia. So here you have a family divided over the cause of, uh, of American independence um, long before the Civil War. Now, we don't know if uh, he ever faced off against his father's, uh, father and brother on the battlefield, but they certainly uh, faced off uh, in ideological differences. Um, and uh, um, so it's a very, very interesting story. And this is where Mary Williams uh, stayed on the farm and gave willingly to Washington's army. And um, uh, uh, Nathaniel Williams, her husband, never came back to uh, West Orange. Uh, he died of smallpox in New York City in 1782. But when he left, he gave a clock to his brother, Benjamin Williams. Uh, it's a, a tall case clock, otherwise known as a grandfather clock. I believe this was a wedding gift to uh, Mary and Nathaniel Williams when they got married in 1755. And um, this clock is actually mentioned in uh, th this 1910 history of belonging to Selena Williams of Orange, who was a uh, uh, descendant. Uh, the clock had passed through several generations of the Williams family, um, uh, but it had gone missing. And uh, this is what it would have looked like. Um, uh, I, I have it here in a reproduction uh, of cabinet and I maybe revealed my secret a little too soon here, but I have this clock today, but the clock had gone missing in, uh, in the 1920s and no one knew what happened to the clock and it showed up at a flea market in uh, Illinois in um, uh, 2008. Uh, make a long story short, I was actually able to purchase the clock and I have the exact clock and this cabinet door here. 
this cabinet door is right in front of me right here. This is the original cabinet door to the clock. And it was the note on this cabinet door here signed by Selena Williams that stated that uh, who this clock belonged to, that it belonged to Benjamin Williams. And it came through uh, from Nathaniel Williams. And it documents uh, the, the, that this is the clock and the clockworks um, that I have here. Um, and hopefully uh, this will go in a museum and hopefully I can put this on display. Uh, but, you know, to have this clock here, I often uh, marvel at the conversations that would have taken place uh, in front of this clock as their family was divided over the cause for American independence. Uh, and as mentioned earlier here, you can see Mary Williams. Uh, she's buried between her, her, her two children here. Nathaniel Williams is not in the cemetery. Uh, before I put up a marker for Mary Williams uh, with the Downtown Alliance, I actually took the marker to the graveyard and put it up against her, uh, her, her tombstone here uh, for this photo op and uh, kind of a way to say thank you because, uh, you know, if you think about the hardships that she must have suffered and, and, and the discord between her and her husband, you know, who, who could have made that decision? You know, what vision did she have for, for this country and American independence? What did she see that no one else saw and that she was so committed to the cause of American independence um, that it's fitting that we certainly remember her here today. Uh, this is just a depiction of her house uh, that she lived in. And this uh, is a cross uh, this is where where she would have lived and the marker is there today uh, and you can certainly visit it uh, at the uh, this location across from Our Lady of Lords Church on Mississippi Avenue. Um, Revolutionary War veterans are buried in this cemetery. There is a um, uh, there's 78 veterans, there's probably more than that, but there is a, uh, a memorial boulder in there that lists all the names of the graves that are there. Many of these graves cannot be found, uh, which, is, which is very distressing. Um, um, and they, uh, this is actually a picture of uh, the Condit family, um, because uh, 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 there's uh, Condit soldiers from the Revolutionary War, uh, and this was dedicated here in the 1920s, I think this, uh, or 1907 it was there. And there's a picture of that. You can't see the boulder, but they're there um, uh, uh, at dedication ceremony. I wanna go back to this slide here. Maybe I show it in another slide, but I just wanna point out uh, on this list is Zenith Williams, Mary's son, uh, who is also buried in this cemetery who fought in the Revolutionary War. Um, one of the papers I was able to find that uh, survived the old church fire was this here, a copy of the West Orange Chronicle, and it lists uh, many of the members of the, um, uh, this is from 1946, and it lists many of the members of the Essex militia here, uh, giving their rank and their regiments. So this is an important piece of information. It's probably hard to find. Um, okay, here is the boulder here. You can see a clear, clear view of it, and I think, uh, oh, and right across from this boulder, is another boulder, a memorial boulder. And uh, this has this plaque on here, um, but I'm sorry to say that plaque is also missing. It's, it, it has succumbed to vandals. That plaque is no longer there. And this is uh, basically a plaque just remembering those founders of the, of the, first, of the first church here. Uh, and this was uh, installed in the 1930s, 1933, I think it says there. Uh, certainly the uh, most iconic image of the uh, First Church Cemetery is the dispatch rider. And that comes from the 1907 Centennial Celebration. And that's the, uh, the badge I'm wearing today. This is a, a picture of it here. And uh, this is uh, very, very much uh, misunderstood, uh, but it's been standing on the corner since 1907. Uh, I believe it was moved slightly in the 1920s when Main Street was rewidened, but it's basically the same statue. Um, and how it came about was uh, David L. Pearson, uh, the orange historian, he's also an author, he's written uh, several books and has left us uh, great works to go by. He visited the old burying ground and found it in deplorable state. And that's why I had this slide in here because this is probably what he found it, uh, when he found it. And uh, through his efforts, a old burying ground association was formed in 1902. And of course he acted as the president uh, and they, you know, they cleaned it up uh, they took out rubbish, dead trees, planted flowers, you know, righted tombstones. Uh, you know, they did their best at, at that time. And um, eventually the old burying ground was taken over, uh, uh, I believe, once again by the church's board of trustees. And, and, you know, there probably was never any money to really take care of it. So 
it probably flourished for a brief period of time under the, uh, the Burying Ground Association. Um, uh, I, there's a memorial here to uh, this tree that was planted um, in the 1930s. And it, uh, it's the George Washington Bicentennial Tree. This plaque is still there. If you visit the, uh, gray, the, the, the cemetery, you'll see that there. Um, I mentioned that the Revolutionary Monument Association was, or I didn't mention, the Revolutionary Monument Association was formed in uh, 1905. And this was the precursor to what's there today. And um, several plans were submitted for uh, what was going to be there. And it, they, they eventually decided upon um, Mr. Ewell uh, uh, on February 12th, Lincoln's birthday, was commissioned to create a statue. And uh, this is a, the first photograph of the, of the bronze casting of the statue he created. And of course, it bears resemblance to what's there today. Uh, this is a picture of him, Frank Ewell. He was renowned. And uh, interestingly, that uh, his works is in orange, but I, I contend that uh, Orange and East Orange are probably the only two bordering towns in the United States that actually have two works of, of a famous sculpture. Because uh, in February uh, 1912, he did a statue of uh, Abraham Lincoln in East Orange. And uh, when the parkway came through and was threatened, the statue was moved in front of East Orange City Hall, where it still is today. Um, so both these, if you visit Orange, you can visit East Orange and see and still see two examples of Ewell's work. This is the uh, dedication of the, uh, oh no, this is the flagpole. This was the uh, uh, June 4th, 1907. This was also brought um, uh, <clears throat> great attention to the old burying ground, uh, the installation of a flagpole. And um, it was at the, um, the, the official unveiling uh, of the flag, uh, I'm sorry, the official availing of the uh, statue took place during the centennial celebration on June 14th, 1907. And uh, the program of exercises, which I mentioned earlier, you can see the statue is on there. And um, this is the, uh, the centennial celebration. Unfortunately, it rained that day, but there are many, many postcards of that, um, of, of, that, uh, of, of that parade. And I believe Don Dorflinger's book he I know he has all the postcards, but he further elaborates on that in his book. Um, and these are newspapers, uh, actual newspapers. I have them right here next to me uh, that survived the 1927 fire um, and uh, that, 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 that first belonged to the first church. And they, uh, they saved these uh, because of, of, the, uh, of, of, the, of the ceremony. And in the picture, there's Dave, David L. Peterson with the uh, sculptor, Frank Ewell. Um, Here's another uh, um, uh, paper that I have. This is the Orange Journal uh, from that day and, and they're uh, intact and they're in pretty good shape. This is the plaque that is still there. Fortunately, that hasn't been stolen. That's right at the base of the, uh, of the, of the statue. Um, and you, and in this photograph there, you can see it on the side. And uh, there's, there's a lot of memorabilia that, apparently, uh, that uh, occasionally shows up on eBay. Uh, it's not expensive. Uh, you know, it's um, you don't know how many of these things have been, uh, have been, uh, were made, uh, let alone survive. Uh, I have this pin here. Um, I have uh, these flags here. These were um, uh, available uh, at Edison's uh, dealers uh, uh, for national photographs, uh, phonographs, not photographs, excuse me. And uh, on that program, actually Edison has a full page ad. So there must've been some connection here. Um, of course, uh, here you see the ad in the Orange Journal. They only cost 25 cents each. And as I mentioned, I'm wearing one here today. I think I have two and a half of them. And, and my half, uh, the, the half is only the bottom portion, not the top portion. And um, they cost 25 cents each. I think I paid, uh, I'm going to say maybe $50 for the one I'm wearing. Um, and I, I probably paid too much for it, but uh, you know, uh, I, I want to preserve these things. So um, I'm not I'm not rich or wealthy by no means, but sometimes of course there's no object when it comes to the right object. Um, here you can see the erecting of the um, of the uh, of the scaffold uh, for the uh, or the, the apparatus to move the uh, statue into place. And here you can see the reviewing stands that were set up and uh, the dedication ceremony. And as I say, it did rain that day. 
This is a picture of Pearson. Uh, I don't know who the other person is, but this is obviously after 1907 and because you can see the uh, dispatch rider statue off to the right. And, um, and you can see that the grounds are in really bad shape even afterwards. You know, they were, they were maybe spruced up, but there were no walls in place. And uh, the thing that is remarkable about this photo, remarkable to me, is if you look at the house to the left-hand side that you can see there, that house is still standing on Main Street. And that house is where my grandfather was born in 1901. It was a boarding house. They didn't live or own it, but they lived, they were boarding at the time there. And that was where my grandfather was born in 1901. I actually have his birth certificate uh, stating that's where he was born. Uh, you can see that they did start to, uh, that is Pearson there. They did start to build the walls. Uh, so the walls weren't constructed until after uh, 1907. So I'd like to, uh, before we conclude here, I'd like to um, just go through some parting points, uh, some parting thoughts I have here uh, for, the, um, for the old burying ground, and then we can uh, hopefully get into uh, uh, some questions and answers here. Um, uh, this is what the, uh, uh, this is a postcard uh, view of the cemetery from the 1940s, and it's really uh, the, the first Presbyterian Church of Orange never looked like this. Um, if you look at this postcard, you can see everything is pristine. The grounds are well maintained. Uh, the dispatch rider is there, and, 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 and there's no tombstones anywhere to be found. Uh, so it's kind of ide idealistic to think that it ever looked like this or will ever look like this. Uh, three centuries of streaming confluence of people, places, and events have brought us to this moment in time. We stand on the threshold of, of the future, but does a, a future exist for the old burying ground? Can it survive another hundred years? The truth is that this is a broken place and has been for more than a century. It has had trouble finding its place in the modern world and would be un an unfamiliar place to many of those who lie here at eternal rest. The remaining tombstones leave behind countless unknown stories of those voices who have long been silenced by the march of time. Rows of graves that are reminiscent of huddled masses struggling to belong as they mark their place in time. Did they come this far just to come this far? Or will this be place be left to a yet unborn generation to discover? Many times there are more questions than answers, but the old burying ground is still here. It survives like a wandering nomad adrift upon the high plains of history, blazing a dusty trail back in time with no direction certain or destination known. This place speaks to me and I can feel its beating pulse with the story it tells because every tomorrow includes a little piece of yesterday as we weave our stories upon the tapestry of life, let us remember that the history of the old burying ground is the collective history of us all. Um, thank you for the Montclair History Center. I'm Joe Fagan and thanks for watching today's presentation. I just wanna get these final thoughts in. There are two great books, The Old Burying Ground uh, by Carol Persett Comfort. Um, her, her book here is, um, not so much a history of the old burying ground, but uh, an intensive research into the graves and the people that are buried there. And the other book, Old Burying Grounds in New Jersey, uh, this is a great book and uh, it lists old burying grounds in New Jersey, but I don't know if by design or by accident, it doesn't list the old burying ground of Orange. Uh, and, I, and I think that just as an oversight because it's gotta be one of the oldest uh, burying grounds in, uh, in, in, in New Jersey. And um, speaking of books, my contact information is here. Uh, I have written four books on the history of West Orange. And if anyone is interested in um, uh, purchasing any of these, certainly contact me. And um, if you have any questions about any, anything you've seen in today's presentation that is not gonna be answered or addressed here, uh, please feel free to reach out to me and uh, I will gladly um, uh, uh, contact you or respond to emails. Um, and you can find me on Facebook as well. So, Great joke. Okay, Thank Jane, so I'm back. That was fascinating. Thank you. You got a lot of questions in the chat room. So I'm well, gonna try and run through them pretty quickly. Um, has there been any effort to identify the descendants of those featured in the headstones? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Um, uh, and, and therein lies a problem because 
uh, in order for anything to be done there, for any graves to remove, be removed, uh, descendants have to be uh, contacted, and that could be a Herculean task of trying to find de descendants. Uh, so the short answer is no, I do not know, uh, but I'm sure that it has happened, but uh, you know, no major effort has been made uh, that I'm aware of. Next question, is Condit Terrace uh, named after the woman that Joe has been talking about, Jemima? It's, it's named after the family uh, because they were, uh, the Condon family, uh, to really follow their genealogy, uh, you really need a scorecard. Um, but yes, it does come from that family. Uh, specifically, if it's named after Jemima, I can't say, I don't know. And by the way, we have one of those books as well. So there are 497 still out there, not 498. So okay. um, uh, the majority of nationalities of the persons buried there. Well, their religious conviction would have been Presbyterian. Um, <clears throat> I would say that they're probably white Anglo-Saxon. Um, there is um, um, uh, African Americans were allowed were were, were uh, members of the First Presbyterian Church, uh, although uh, because of the prejudice of the day, they had their own section within the church. And um, just next door in St. Mark's Church, there actually is a Negro burying ground uh, that is contained uh, little known, uh, it, it, that's very little known information there. Unfortunately, it's in the back of St. Mark's Cemetery and uh, it has been built over by the apartment buildings there. Uh, but Vince does have uh, records pertaining to that. And I have to say, I mentioned it, but it's worth repeating. Uh, Vince has taken the task on himself of restoring that cemetery and has done an excellent job. I see Karen Wells is on, on here and she I just seen that she has a map of the Negro burying ground. Uh, so that's good to know. So Karen Wells is um, uh, also a contact person there. But the question is, uh, I would say white Anglo-Saxon. Um, uh, beyond that, I really don't know. And Vince says also St. Mark's are mostly British and, and Irish as well. Um, okay, next question. Are the oranges so named because of a Dutch connection? If not, why was orange chosen as that name? Well, um, the Dutch certainly were the first settlers in, 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 in one of the first settlers in, in, the, uh, in, in New Jersey. And a lot of the old cemeteries have uh, Dutch influence. There really is no Dutch influence here. Uh, orange actually comes, the name Orange actually comes from the, uh, the Duke of Orange. It was so named uh, when Orange first separated from Newark in 1806. Uh, they took on the name of uh, Orange Dale actually was the name. It was actually Orange Dale. Um, and, um, uh, uh, you know, after a, a few years, the Dale just dropped off and it was known as Orange. And, um, uh, West Orange and East Orange came out of uh, uh, Orange was carved up uh, and formed West Orange and East Orange uh, in, in the same year, 1863, actually. Yes. They asked why the Shiloh Church is not maintaining the property. Well, the, that's that's not necessarily true. The, 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 the Shiloh Church is maintaining the property. Um, the Shiloh Church is very committed to the history of, 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 the, of the place they have. And if I misrepresented their intentions when they moved in, uh, of like they don't care about the history, that's certainly not true at all. They care very deeply about the history. They just don't necessarily understand the history. Um, they are hard pressed as any, as any church is today. They certainly have a limited amount of funding. Um, they don't basically know how to maintain the graveyard. They are maintaining the building. In fact, when I was there uh, just a few weeks ago, they actually had an electrician there uh, repairing some lighting so that the uh, place could be lit to uh, perhaps discourage further uh, vandalism. But vandalism is the problem. Uh, there, basically, people can just come and go as as uh, as they want here, and they come in, and you know they can't combat the problem of vandalism. Um, so they're doing the best that they can, and they would like to do better. Um, but, you know, currently, uh, you know, it's, uh, they're, they're up against the two and, you know, they, they, they're learning their history, they're understanding their history, I would love to work with them, if they have any questions, um, but, uh, you know, they, they're doing the best they can is, is the best answer. Um, and what is a dispatch rider? 
the dispatch rider basically takes its name from the, you know, uh, again, during the American Revolution, uh, obviously there was no cell phones, there was really no form of communication that predates the telegraph. So a horseback rider basically was the way of um, uh, delivering messages. And even throughout the um, throughout the first mountains in, in West Orange, all along the ridge of the Wachung Mountains, there were actually signal towers. Um, but the way that the message um, uh, got by was they would actually have to hand write a message and send out a writer, a rider. Uh, and so the, it represents the dispatch rider. And the, um, uh, the, um, the belief is that the dispatch rider was modeled after men from Orange. Now, whether that's true or, or a myth, I don't know. But that's what a dispatch rider is. It's you know a, one that was delivering the messages during the days of the American Revolution uh, that hopefully helped win uh, our independence. Um, is it on the federal or state register? That I'm not sure of. Um, uh, that I, I, my my guess would be no. Uh, but I, I that don't take that as definite. I don't know. Uh, maybe there is even works underway to um, uh, to to get something in uh, in place there. Um, uh, Vince Damon is saying people regularly hang out and drink in St. Mark's Cemetery, and there's always liquor bottles there. Uh, at least he cleans it up in St. Mark's. Uh, if you walk through the old burying ground, you're going to find a lot of uh, a lot of that type of litter there. Uh, that you know it just doesn't get cleaned up that often, unfortunately. Uh, to answer your question, Jane, no, I don't know if it is. And then Robert Reed told, Reed told me that some gravestones were in the church basement. Are they still that there, do you know? Uh, well, Robert Reed, as you know, was the church historian, and I didn't men mention his name, but Robert Reed uh, was the one who gave me a lot of the stuff that they were throwing out. And also, uh, um, uh, when the church was closing, he... Um, he mentioned to me, hey, you should contact the pastor, see if you get Olaf's tombstone. Uh, Robert Reed is in his 90s. I haven't spoken to him uh, in, in a number of years. Uh, he was always um, uh, a, a great steward of history. And yes, uh, he has told me that story too. There are, um, because don't forget, the church was buried uh, or, 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 or displaced graves, and there still are some graves uh, reportedly in the uh, in the church basement. I've never seen them, but I am told uh, by Robert Reed and others that they are there, yes. The, uh, first of all, Karen Wells did say that they, Shiloh is working with the, um, with the Orange Group, and they've actually repaired that wall on the one side, which is lovely. Um, uh, if somebody wants to try and find the grave of somebody who's there, who can they speak to? Jim Peskin was asking. Um, well, email me the information, number one, uh, because I do have the church records of all the records that are buried there. But the best, absolute best resource for that would be Carol Person at Comfort's book. She goes in depth, as they say, it's not so much a history of the church as I presented here today, uh, but she really goes into depth. She really went through painstaking efforts to, uh, to uh, document all the people that are buried there. You might not be able to find the grave because unlike it over at Rosedale, you can walk into the office and they'll tell you a lot and block and give you a map. And, and if they have time, they'll even walk you to the site there. You're not gonna be able to find a lot and block. You're gonna have to actually go there and look. But uh, if you got Carol's book, you'd be able to tell uh, def definitely if the person was interred there or not. Um, the, we've all learned the Montclair story is that Tony Brook is from Anthony Olive. Can you comment on that? Yes. Um, in fact, um, yes, I believe that is the case. Uh, the exact connection eludes me at the moment, but if on that 1720 map I showed earlier, which is actually in Stephen Wick's book from 1896, um, it's a copy of the map. I believe Tony's Brook is actually um, um, listed on there. Um, actually, I'm, I'm a little confused myself because Tony's path which is easily confused with Tony's Brook. Tony's path was the name of the path given that Olaf would take to his uh, house. Uh, Tony's Brook is in orange. So I think I confused there Tony's path with Tony's Brook. But uh, George, Tony's Brook for sure, I believe is on the- George Musser is, on, is, on, on, yes. is on the call as well. And he says he's researching that. Uh, George, would you just type your email address in the chat room if, um, or you can say it out loud if you'd like to. Um, uh, I actually George, believe I have George, George, yes, George, if that's the, I believe, yes, I believe that's George who researching, 
researching is not the right name for what George does. Right, George he did a great is, presentation. Uh, it's also on our YouTube channel. So if anybody is interested in that. Piecing he, together, I have been, I, I have supplied information to George and he's a great source of information. And uh, if it wasn't for guys like George, history would really be, would be totally, totally lost. So yeah, um, George, I, I have been in touch with George and, and any information I have is his information. Um, I, I just haven't uh, talked to him recently. Uh, oh, I see over there, George now. Yeah, uh, and look at all those books there um, uh, that he has there. But yeah, George, George, I actually found some more deeds, George. I have to get them to you. Um, so I'm going to wrap this to up right Brian. now. Um, anybody can stay on for a couple of minutes if you'd like to. I'm putting in the chat room once more the Survey Monkey. I would love it if you could give us, you know, two minutes of your time to fill that out. And uh, Joe, thank you so very, very much. Let everybody who wasn't My on pleasure. here know that uh, Joe will be back on tonight. And um, um, so, yeah, thank you, Joe. Always fascinating. Really enjoyed it. Take care.